Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Supplement. Coming up on today's show, Pep Guardiola. He claims Raheem Sterling's like VAR because he talks about his match winner in every press conference every week. Frank Lampard, he's happy to talk. Christian Pulisic, the American, scored a hat-trick in Chelsea's thumping 4-2 win at Burnley yesterday. And Southampton, they march on with Raul Passenhutel in charge despite Friday's shocking 9-0 defeat at home to Leicester. Getting a vote of confidence this morning. Sam Wallace is the chief football writer with The Telegraph. Charlie Wyatt is football editor at The Sun and Ian Ladyman is the football editor at The Daily Mail. Morning all, thanks morning. for joining us this morning here on The Supplement. Don't forget you can tweet the show at Sunday Sub, the best will appear on screen over the next 90 minutes. Let's have a look at the papers then. Sam was at the Etihad yesterday to watch this man, the shooting Sterling. He's on the front of the Sun's goals pull out, uh, 17 goals in 18 games for Sterling for club and country this season. Pep Guardiola positively purring about him. We'll talk about uh, Sterling in a few moments' time. Mr Perfect, Pulisic, left foot, right foot, and a header yesterday in Chelsea's victory, a handsome victory at Turf Moor. It's seven in a row now for Frank Lampard, the American Idol. Um, was out of the picture a few weeks ago. He's definitely in it now as a Chelsea player. Lots of rugby around, as you'd expect this morning after England's victory over New Zealand, 19-7 yesterday to progress to the World Cup final. One or two football stories, though. Kai Havertz and Thomas Muller uh, being targeted by Manchester United, according to uh, Steve, ba Steve Bates this morning on the back of the uh, Sunday People. And Unai Emery, he says that his decision to axe Mesut Ozil from the Arsenal <coughs> squad has been backed by the club's uh, boards. Uh, back of the Sunday Mirror, another deadline for Newcastle, another deadline for Peter Kenyon. This time he says he's taken over in January, according to um, uh, Clive Hetherington in the uh, Sunday Mirror, back of the Sunday Mirror this morning. The Sunday Telegraph, Sam's paper. We'll talk about Tottenham and Liverpool in part two of today's programme. But Tottenham continue to slip, uh, according to Sam Dean. Liverpool stroll on to another level. They both won in the Champions League very comfortably in the week. They meet, to get, meet today up at Anfield. Graham Souness in the Sunday Times, his hard-hitting column. And it is a hard-hitting column today. Uh, the game's become a burden to Delhi Alley. What next for the uh, Tottenham forward? Why have I not progressed? We'll talk about him in part two of today's uh, programme. But as uh, it was such a magnificent day in the World Cup semi-final, I said, I know you watched it. And I've <laughs> I know you're looking forward to talking about it. We're here to talk football, but um, I know you watched it yesterday and you were particularly impressed, of course, I think with the manner of England's victory. I think it was a brilliant performance. Mm. I think it doesn't matter what, what sport you're into or what kind of floats your boat. If you see an English team play like that against one of the world superpowers, then you've got to be impressed and um, I think most of us around this table and most of us in our professional will be trying to watch the final next Saturday morning. Mm, absolutely will. Charlie, I know you had a busy day yesterday. Did you watch it? Because you were at the... I did, you yeah. You watched some football yeah, yesterday as well. Yeah, watched some football in the afternoon. Mm. Yeah, good. good, good. Sam, you at the Etihad, making your way up there. Um, talk us through the, the manner of the performance and uh, in particular one man, which is Raheem Sterling. Hat-trick in the week against uh, the Italians Atalanta and then just continue his good form yesterday. Um, First real opportunity he gets to start the second mm. half, scores. Yeah, he um, he was outstanding again. I think it's becoming the norm, really. Yeah. And um, Guardiola, Guardiola doesn't make many jokes in his post-match press conferences, but he was he was in the he was in the mood for it yesterday, and he said that, uh, as you said earlier, that Raheem crops up as often as as VAR does because mm. he's such a a major focus for what City do. Um, he, one point that Guardiola made was that he felt that the first half Sterling set the standard. He didn't feel City were up to their normal um, their normal standards before the break, and then and and it was him that drove them on. He scored 20 seconds into the second half. Um, I, I, I think you know, as far as Raheem's concerned, his he it, it's becoming it's becoming such a, a regular occurrence, sort of tossing up his goals and his assists. He's he's on the long list. Uh, for the Ballon d'Or. It was very interesting uh, because Guardiola sort of runs out of superlatives. It's always interesting to hear the other manager talk about him. And, and Dean Smith picked him out and he said one of the things that the, the, he, he says, look, City will hurt you all over the pitch. They're, they're, they're extremely good in... It's just this comment he made about anticipating where the ball will drop. And I always think that's part of the Guardiola way. Football is full of, 90 minutes are full of so many random events, mm. you know, loose balls dropping here and it's spinning off and a bad touch. And that the kind of, what Guardiola seems to be doing is, 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 is crushing those sort of uncontrollables until they're just a very small part of the game. They control, and, and Dean Smith said that, he said the funny thing about City is they seem to know where the ball is going to drop in the most random events. Mm. 
And Sterling, he said, is the ultimate player for hurting you in behind. And he said there's two things about him. He's so quick, obviously, we know, when he goes in behind. He, we see that so often, him just appearing behind the fullback, running onto a little ball from one of the Silvers or Kevin De Bruyne. He said, but the other thing he can do is stop. He can, go, he can be at full speed and, mm -hmm. and almost just slam on the brakes and then cut back in. And uh, he, he, Clearly, he's in, you know, he's in great form. Um, or his whole, you know, his whole career has taken off. Has gone to a different level. He's uh, he's being courted by the, the great commercial giants, you know, yeah. who who we've Which seen. Which you've written about, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. his his boot deal is up for um, for renewal at the end of the season. There's all sorts lining up to 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 be his new endorsee in that way. I think he's just signed a deal with Gillette, who famously Beckham and Henri were. Mm -hmm. So he's really he's clearly he's in terms of what he's doing on the pitch and he's profile around the world he is he is you know he's one of the great stars of the game now and the question is you know how long can he stay there how much can he win yeah what, what do you think drives him? what's motivates him I, lo I love uh, Rob Draper's um, intro I love uh, what more can be said about Raheem Sterling followed by 800 words um, <laughs> praising Raheem Sterling <clears throat> that's not a criticism of Robbie Rob's a good friend of ours and a regular on on the show but Sam mentioned that what else is there to say about say about this guy, but he continues to def almost to defiantly score goals and win matches for City. And, and, he, and he's being rewarded for you know, a hell of a lot of hard work. Uh, you know, he's obviously born with a natural talent, but I think we've got to appreciate that he's worked so hard on his finishing. Before um, Liverpool played Barcelona, Luis Suarez did a in really good interview with a couple of the papers, and he mentioned Sterling, and he did sort of say how, at times, bad his finishing was in training. And it was an area that he really had to work on. Obviously, Suarez, incredible uh, striker, natural talent. So, you know, it's not something that's come easily. And I think we've got to give a lot of credit for Sterling for spending hours and, and working so hard and studying how he's had to improve. You know, he really has done incredibly well. He's going to get even better. Obviously, great news for England as well. Uh, I was at the Palace game eight days ago. It probably wasn't one of his better Could performances, yeah. And you know, Guardiola was in a particularly bad mood after that game and did sort of, you know, dig out both Sezu Sterling for saying that they're not taking enough of their chances, which is when you consider this season of average three goals a game. Mm -hmm. uh, might seem a bit harsh that the manager's criticising offensive players, but we thought last year could City get any better and actually a few of their players are defensively, maybe not. Yeah. On on the Ballon d'Or um Long list. Is he? Is he in that? Um, he's clearly in the mix. But how far away is he from the the category of of Messi and Ronaldo? He's talked. He has talked about it recently and said, "Look, I need to be scoring 40, 50 goals a season for ten year, for ten years in a row." Um, but he's on target to do something like that this season. I don't think he's that far away from it. Obviously, he's being modest when he says that. I think deep down he will know that his numbers are beginning to stack up towards that level. It doesn't have to be about goals, although they help. Obviously, assists, assists um, will sit in there as well. Um, it's really interesting what Charlie said about um, Guardiola criticising him last week at, at Palace because it reminded me a little bit of something that Ryan Giggs said last year when he was looking back on his career and Giggs said um, that Alex Ferguson used to criticise two players <coughs> of that class, of that kind of treble-winning era, more than any others, and it was David Beckham and Ryan Giggs. And Giggs at the time used to sit there and think, why is he picking? Why is he picking on me? Why is he picking on me? Why is he not picking on Gary Neville? Why is he not picking on David May? Why is he not picking on Phil Neville? And he's looked back now and realised that the reason was because the other players would see that Ferguson was digging out the two stars or two of the big stars in the team, and they would all think, blimey, if you can criticise them, that means that I've got to get better. Mm -hmm. And I think there might be a little bit of that with Guardiola now and Sterling. He will go on television or in the press conference with us and dig out one of his top three players, if not his best player, knowing that other players in the squad will hear it and know that they've got to keep their standards high as well. Um, he's, Sterling has got to a point now where not only does he wonder if he's going to score going into a game and maybe even fear a chance coming, because he did look like that for a while, especially with England, that he really almost didn't want to be in those positions. Now he goes into a game thinking, well, I'll score today. And he's getting to a point where on um, Wednesday in the Champions League game, he's, he's elbowing Sergio Aguero out the way to get to a, to get to a, a chance mm -hmm. that actually should have been Aguero's chance. Because every time a ball is in that area, Sterling now thinks, 
I'm going to get that and I'm going to score. And it's an incredible kind of sense of confidence that, he, that he's currently playing with. What's, what's he worth? Transfer, transfer market, what, in terms of valuation, what's this guy worth? He's got now? quite a long contract. So, um, 150? I, I just, I think the, the problem, I think if you look at the market now, I think he's a great player. I think 10 years ago, that, you know, he is a, he's a target for Real Madrid and Barcelona. I don't think they're going to take players off Manchester City anymore. I mean, you look at Aguero, who spent his whole career there, and where people thought, well, you know, is he a bit of a mercenary? Is he doing them a favour? But, well, no, I, even I sort of thought at first he might do a few years David there and then Silver move on. The David Silver so I think, um, I, 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 absolutely, you, you can put a kind of hypothetical value on him, but City are so strong now. Which club is really going to come in? And so, They might be able to offer, you know, a, a different lifestyle, a, a kind of a club with, let's, you know, a bigger history like, um, like a Madrid or a Barcelona. But are they really going to be able to match City for... For for um, transfer fee and for wages, I, I'm I'm just not sure they can anymore. I mean, no. I wouldn't be a, a, against him if he if he did do that. I, a part of me thinks it'd be quite good to see him go and have a go, not for reasons, not for financial reasons or anything like that, just to go and play somewhere else and abroad, one of the big super clubs abroad, and see see how see how he does it because it's been a while since we've had an opportunity to watch mm. one of our top players go and do that. Mm. Also, I mean, you think he signed his last contract about a year ago. Mm. He's done so much since then. It's not unreasonable for him to say, "Hang on a minute, you know, I need to Give be the t more. I need to be the top earner at this club," because when you look at when you look at what he does week in week out, and you look at his numbers, why why would he not have parity? I mean, I'm sure he's not I'm sure he's not you know earning what Angelino's earning, but I mean, he, he certainly needs to be. You know, he, he certainly has that right to negotiate. Yeah, sure. OK. We need to talk about a few other issues, actually, Sam, because, because you were at the game, and one of them is uh, VAR. This is John Moss spending the best part of, what, two minutes or so? Mm. We're wait, waiting, waiting, waiting for a decision. How did, it, how did you think he handled that moment? This is David Silver, this is Raheem Sterling, the offside. Um, well, it went on for a long time, uh, uh, to the point where that kind of... It, it, it sort of it becomes slightly like the theatre of the absurd. People are saying, "Well, when, when is this game going to start? Have I got time to go and get a drink?" You know, it. it, it, it you're worried of, about the train, the home yeah, train home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the trains were pretty bad from London to Manchester yesterday, but um, it was it was starting to think that the, the flooding on the line might have cleared by the time Jonathan Moss had made his mind. And I'm not criticising Jonathan because I'm sure it's, it's it's hard when you're under that sort of pressure. Uh, but the, the 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 I mean, it was the classic case of the video was not conclusive. I mean, we can talk our way through the decision. Basically, Raheem was, on a, was in an onside position when Kevin De Bruyne struck the ball. But if it flicks off David Silva, as the goals panel later decided it did, he's actually in an offside position. So then the question is, is he seeking to gain an advantage? Which is the old, is he interfering with play? And, I mean, Dean Smith was very much of the view that, that he was. Mm. He sort of twisted kind of dexterously out the way so the ball went past him. Yep. Uh, but it kind of felt like Tom Heaton. It did affect Tom Heaton's judgment of the situation, and I think I think Villa had a very very strong case for that goal to be disallowed. The funniest thing about it is that David Silva then gets awarded the goal, but, and and the explanation is is that the goals panel is completely different to the VAR. So, but they both come under the aegis of the Premier League. Yeah. yeah. And people said that VAR would sort out all our problems, and I'm afraid and it are. just hasn't. Yeah. We've got some more to talk about a little bit later on as well. Um, another issue at uh, City is uh, John Stones. Played yesterday, started yesterday, and we had that situation earlier in the week when Pep Guardiola was remonstrating with him, uh, Stones coming on as a substitute against Atalanta, basically because he wasn't prepared, wasn't ready, um, and pretty critical of, um, and understandably so, about um, one of his... Uh, one of his own players not being prepared to come walk onto the pitch. Look, yesterday, been, said you're starting. It's, it's been a look, frustrating spell for him, hasn't it? And it's been, you know, very frustrating for Gareth Southgate as well. You know, we're not blessed with too many decent centre back, right footed centre backs, as we saw in the last international, where because Joe Gomez equally is struggling massively. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen the fact that we've had to have, you know, a left footed centre back, Harry Maguire, switch across. So, you know, it's not just Guardiola, but Gareth Southgate really needs John Stones to really fulfil his potential, improve, and he needs to improve. You know, we saw him again. You know, the Nations League, he had a had a shocker, and yeah, that is an area City are not blessed with too many centre backs at the moment. They're having a nightmare, aren't they? That's their weak point. That's the the one 
area that if they did make a move in January, they're going to have to bring in a, a centre-back. So City needs Stones to get himself right, get his head right, because I think that's probably the, the, the weakness is in his head, because I think he is a, you know, a naturally gifted, uh, is a great defender, can be a great defender, and City need him to, to get not, some confidence. Charlie, not being ready to come on against Atalanta, how would you feel about that? Look, that, that's not great. We've seen it before. That's, again, just not concentrating. Um, and, and I think sometimes his problem for when he's actually played is not how, there's no question about how good John Stones is, is whether he concentrates all the time. So we've seen that, but he clearly is an issue off the pitch as well. So uh, that, that's, uh, yeah, there's no, absolutely no excuse for that. That's, that's cool. We start our line here with things like you know, jewellery, where's the shirts, sending, sending the kit man down the tunnel to find the player's shirt, shin pads not on. I, I think that's completely unacceptable for, for a player. You should, be ready. you should be ready to come on 30 seconds notice if necessary. You, you should be ready, absolutely. Although Pep Guardiola does have a little bit of history for kind of exaggerating certain things with his players. Pep can get very, very cross very, very quickly about very small things. So I'd quite like to hear John Stones' version of events here and find out just how unprepared oh, he, a, he actually was. Well, let's, I, all we saw was, was Pep having a go at one of his players, which he does from time to time. He's a, you know, he likes the histrionics, he's an emotional man. I'd quite like to hear John Stone's version of events. Well, what do you think, what do you think those, that version of events would be? His version of events may the, well the, be... Five minutes earlier, he said, get yourself off, you've got an early cut. His, his version of events may well be, I was, I was ready, all I had to do was take my coat off. The manager, <laughs> the manager was getting out of his box for no reason. I'd just like to hear what he's got to say about mm. it. Is I it doubt Ar that we ever will hear that, hear that it, version. Was it Arsenal a couple of seasons ago when, was it Podolski, one of the players was supposed to come on and he couldn't find his shin pads? I think was, one of the Arsenal players was actually the other subs was hiding his shin pads. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> <laughs> How, how did he play yesterday, Sam? Um, I, th I think there was one small error when the ball was given to McGinn. Uh, I hope I'm not unjustly giving that one to John, but uh, I think he did. And there was a shot, and a, it came. It was saved, and there was a little. There was Douglas Luiz almost got the rebound. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was he was comfortable. Um, I, I feel like uh, I, I, with with Stones, I always go back to what Gareth Southgate says about him, which is. We are asking these lads to do something we've probably never asked English centre-halves to do in the history of the national team, which is take the ball and try and play under mm -hmm. huge pressure. And in the modern game, where the top sides, like Spain and so on, they make, they, 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 they all the, you know, the, the top eight European sides, which Gareth always talks about, including England, will put you under pressure. And I've got a lot of admiration for any centre-half that has got the kind of uh, courage to do mm -hmm. that, because... I watch him sometimes and I am on the edge of my seat and I remember the Holland game at Wembley where I think it was even Vincent Janssen robbed him and, and I felt I was critical of him and I looked back on that piece and I thought, you know what, yeah, he did make a mistake but it was tough, it is tough and, and culturally our, our centre-halves, we are going into a new era now. You know, we're not, the, the Gareth Southgate, when he was playing, didn't have to do that, he headed it and he kicked it and he tackled. So I'm prepared to give him a little bit of um, little well, bit if, of you, um, that is... if you want to come to, uh, if you want to find out or have a look at how the beautiful game should be played, come to Wembley on uh, is it November the nineteenth? Um, I'm we've not got... playing. You're not playing. No, I, I think uh, I, I think I think the um, I think the days of old journalists like us running around Wembley. Is, well, I think for people would be outraged at that. I, 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 would, I would ask the viewers to come this and, and, this, and protest outside. This, this is the, this is the, you obviously, no, <laughs> well, I'm, <laughs> somehow I'm manager of this team. This is the England press against the, uh, against the FA at, at Wembley Stadium on, uh, I think it's November the night. Why have you ruled yourself out? Um, they thought you were, you I weren't think there's manager. A, there's a new generation of very, of very able young journalists who I think do a much better job. And I yeah. think it's, as, as, as Gareth Southgate's done with the England senior team, it's time to, time to move them on. I say, retiring from international duty, Sam. Who do you think you are? <laughs> it's the manager's many, choice. Yeah, isn't manager's it? choice. And I'm that manager, but, so I'd like to see you there. OK, um, we'll be there at Anfield a little bit later on. It's Liverpool against Tottenham. More on that game that's coming next. <laughs> Welcome back, Liverpool Tottenham this afternoon at uh, Anfield. Let's talk. Uh, Graham Sunnis has highlighted Deli Allen in his column this morning. Charlie in the Sunday Times says the game's become a burden. Deli Alley needs to look himself in the mirror and ask, uh, why have I not uh, progressed? He's back in the Tottenham team. It's taken him a little bit of uh, time 
uh, to uh, to force his way back in. I suspect their poor form might be one of those reasons. But uh, Graham, in his Sunday Times piece this morning, says uh, two years ago he thought Deli Ali uh, would be a superstar. But the point he makes um, in his column this morning is he hasn't really kicked on. He hasn't really progressed, and he's not a superstar. What um, what are your thoughts on uh, the progress of Ali's career? Well, you know, for a start, he's absolutely spot on. Yeah, and, and I remember, yeah, two or three years ago, Tottenham fans used to debate, you know, which which, which, which it, Ali. Play, you know, Ali or Kane, which is the best, which one would we really, you know, wouldn't want to lose? They wouldn't want to lose either of them, obviously. Uh, and the difference between how you know Kane has been consistent and you know so professional and kicked on, where Dele, Dele Ali shouldn't just be, you know, one of the best players in the Tottenham team. Be one of the best players, most effective players in the England team because he's such a talented player, and we've known this for for so long. Um, but his form and his attitude at times is a worry, um, and I'd sort of put him in the same bracket as James Madison. Yeah, again, another outstanding talent. Um, but I think if you ask Gareth Southgate, well, quite quite obviously, um, Southgate wouldn't have either of those in his starting team at the moment uh, because obviously there's a few years a few years apart. But they're quite similar uh, in there's, you know, you want players to have a certain type of attitude and cockiness, of, of course you do. But Dele Alli is not getting the best out of himself. Uh, and he has to, as Graham Souness rightly says, he has to look at himself. He, he can't blame anyone else. Um, and if he's not careful, um, he will continue to struggle to get into the England team you, and the squad you... and won't be at the Euros. I can see if there's one player who could drop out totally, um, that'd be Dele Alli. Well, he's way down the queue at the moment. You yeah. just mentioned Madison. You've also got Mason Mount, who played well again yesterday uh, for Chelsea in a more advanced role. You said Deli Ali's attitude. What did you mean by that? I, I think you know, generally you need to be focused, don't you? And that's how you, you, you look after yourself um, you know, during the weeks. You know, you're making sure you know, football is the priority. Obviously, he's one of these players. There's nothing wrong with having other interests and business things outside football. I think that's great, actually. Um, but... Uh, you know, quite, quite clearly, I, I just don't think he's focused in the way that he should be. And that's something, uh, again, look at Harry Kane, look at the way he looks after himself. Um, not saying all players have to have their own private chef like, like Harry does, but you know, clearly that's, that's, that's helped him, that's benefited him. And, and he, you know, he eats right and so he looks after himself. Mm -hmm. and clearly, you know, there is an issue because Deli Alley's not playing as well as he should be because he's a, you know, a brilliant footballer. Uh, and, and Spurs and England really need him. Yeah, they certainly do. He'll be alarmed about the England situation as well, won't he? He really will. That was a real wake-up call for him. Or it should have been a wake-up call from the fact he wasn't in the last last England squad. Um, I've been. It was the first one he was excused because he was just coming back from injury. Yeah. This one was well, he was, just not here. He was out. Yeah. Um, I was kind of musing on this a few weeks ago. It, not just him, but with Dyer, Eric Dyer as well. The way that the two of them have really kind of. Not dropped off the radar because they're still very much on the radar, but but the the steps backwards have taken since the last World Cup, for example. Um, I remember going into that World Cup with people talking about uh, Deli Ali as one of the players who could help us win the thing, and that that World Cup isn't that isn't that long in the in the past, and here he is not in a squad. Um, he's got a huge challenge now because it's it's always interesting to see how players react when they're in these situations, whether they because all players do, all players go through dips, mm -hmm. and we talked. For 50 minutes early about Raheem Sterling, there'll be one coming for him along the line at some point because all players have them. But it's how you respond. And Delhi looks to me when I have seen him play. I think it was correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was the Bayern Munich game, the one at home or one game, Tottenham game I was at when he came on and he just didn't look the same player in any way. And he actually looked You've to me. You've forgotten about it. Tottenham he, fans he, would like he, to forget about he it. He actually well. looked to me a little bit like a footballer who would kind of forgotten how to play. And was, and was feeling a little bit sorry for himself. He looked in his body language, the way he carried himself around the field, as if he was feeling a little bit sorry for himself. And I'm afraid he can't afford to do that. Um, the only other thing I would say about him was that I did always think back in the day when he was the kind of rising star of that Tottenham team, the rising star of the England team, that there were, there were always far too many stories in newspapers about Delhi and Real Madrid and Delhi and PSG and Delhi and other great clubs. And I did sometimes look at those stories, probably because I wasn't the one who was getting them, but I did look at some of those stories and think, where are those coming from and why? And when why now? Why, do we, why does Delhi need those stories in the papers now when he's only just become a regular mm -hmm. England player and Tottenham player? And I did wonder then whether that was a sign of, of, of a problem down the line. Mm. 
six years, uh, well, he's got five years left at Tottenham. One of the uh, players on the, on the other side of the pitch this afternoon could well be Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, Sam. Um, you've written about him recently in his recovery and the long, hard yards that you have to put in to, to recover, to get back and to force your way back into not only to train at Liverpool, but to become a first-team player again. But in the week in the Champions League, we saw some of the reasons, I think, the reasons why Jurgen Klopp likes him so much. And he's always, yeah. he always speaks so highly. He actually always speaks so warmly and so highly of him. It's not the criticism that we talked about of Pep Guardiola remi reminding Raheem Sterling. It doesn't feel that that sort of relationship doesn't exist between Klopp and, and the Ox. He loves him. He does. Yeah, I, I think um, I think Klopp's more than capable of being tough on him mm. if he has to be. Um, uh, yeah, they, they were two fantastic goals. Uh, uh, particularly, obviously, the second one has been picked out for the way he just took it first yeah. time, and yeah. it was. It was such a lovely technique. But the, what really struck me from the conversations that I had with him over that terrible injury that he got um, in, in the Roma uh, semi-final, it wasn't it, um, was, was that it was with his right leg. And his right leg was the one that was, you know, really terribly damaged in, in that challenge with Kolarov. And, and I think what, when we talk about injuries with footballers, we often concentrate on the knee because it's such a delicate instrument, delicate kind of... Uh, nexus of muscle and bone and, and ligament but but what uh, Alex Oxley Chamberlain was most worried about was was his um, his lateral hamstring the knee yes you know there was an ACL it did go but in thankfully in the modern era that can be repaired um, but his his lateral hamstring I mean to describe it sort of went up like a roller blind mm -hmm. I mean it, it it had to be the graft had to be completely refixed and and, and one of the things he it, it, that really stuck with me that he said was that I have to get used to the new normal. He basically got a new knee built for him, and and um, he did every every minute of that rehabilitation over 12 months. And I know these lads get paid a lot of money, and you know they have the best physios in the world and beautiful gyms to work out in. But it is depressing, <laughs> you know. It's a sure, long sure. slog, and you're always at the back of your mind. You're thinking, Am I ever going to be back? And the way he stunned that ball, the way he struck it, that just said to me, that right leg looks perfect. And and. Um, you know, I'm sure. You know, he, he's he's very philosophical. It's small steps, but it looks like he has the new normal is going to be just fine. It's going to be like the old normal, and that that's great. That's really good. Yeah, good good for him. Good to see Alex Oxlade Chamberlain not only back in Liverpool shirt, but also playing well, scoring goals as uh, as he did in the Champions League. You were there for that game as well, uh, Charlie, in the week. Uh, Sam Dean's piece this morning um, in the, in Sam's paper, The Telegraph, he says there's a stark contrast between the two Champions League finalists going into this game. Tottenham continuing to slip um, and slide Liverpool strolling to another level. Pochettino's quotes, we're two different clubs with two different philosophies and two different ways to play and two different objectives, but we're in the same race competing for the same titles. I, I don't understand why... They are two different clubs. I don't understand why he's saying they've got two different philosophies and two different ways to play and two different objectives. What would be so? What would be so obviously different between I, the two clubs' targets? Oh, well, I, th I think again, you know, if, if we were sort of speaking off air, if you go back four years ago, four years ago last week was Klopp's first game as Liverpool manager against Spurs, nil nil. Uh, and that game, you've only got maybe three or four players. You know, Lovren. I, I was at that game, Charlie, and I, I said to Klopp afterwards, "Is this the, your first?" First time in London with a with a team, and he said, "No, I was here for the Champions League final with Borussia Dortmund, <laughs> a game I was also at." Well, well yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you've, you've got so playing that day was Lallana, Milner, and Origi, and Henderson and Lovren were there, but at, at the club, but not playing. Um, then you're looking at, I think, eight or nine of the current Tottenham team were that team there, and that just proves that they've not they've not changed. And I think that is Pochettino's frustration. Those quotes there. It, that they've not had the money that he wanted. Obviously, they've moved stadium, but they've not necessarily got the players. They've not changed it up enough. And even when they have signed players in the summer with uh, Ryan Sessegnon and Lo Celso, uh, Daniel Levy spent three months haggling and messing about, uh, and they've come late, then got injured rather than have proper pre-seasons. So, well, that, whereas Liverpool that, have spent so in much Lombardy, money... In, in the week, look, looked... Well, he looked like Platini at times, the way he was carving, op carving opening... Uh, chances, but yeah, but, but you need more than you know one or two players. I, I think Tottenham are and, and, and now suffering for not bringing in enough sort of you know fresh blood. 
um, and you know looking at Liverpool. So they have had a lot of money. You've got to, as, as Klopp's done a brilliant job, but they have spent so much money. But they, but then equally, they spent know, it well. That's the key. Spent it well. They spent it well. They haven't, and, and also I think they spend as well. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> you but, don't get a trophy. Yeah. <laughs> but also the, the genius of Klopp, I think, again, he's not given enough credit. If they've signed players from the relegated clubs, haven't they? Wijnaldum, you know, Robertson, you know, or, 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 or uh, Shakiri all suffered relegation in the Premier League, yet Liverpool still had a chance, took a chance on them. And that's really good management. Uh, so, yeah, they are, I, th I think at the moment, that the gap between those two is going to increase. We're talking about the, the, the quotes that you don't understand from Pochettino. I mean, it's not an uncommon situation to find yourself in as a journalist now, is it, to not understand <laughs> Pochettino quotes and what he means and where he's coming from. I and mean, one, one of the differences between the two managers is that there, there is a, a, a consistent message from Klopp Always, if you're a Liverpool player, you can be in absolutely no doubt as to what your manager is thinking, hoping, and wanting. If you're a Tottenham player, and you could previously say that about Pochettino, you can't say that about him anymore. His message is so inconsistent, and players, players want consistency from the manager. They want consistency of, of tactics and routine and selection and message and philosophy, to use that awful word, and Tottenham players don't get that from Pochettino anymore. One minute he's talking about signing players in January, the next minute he's saying that he, not, he can't sign players in January. One minute he's criticising the kind of feeling inside the squad, the next week he's saying, oh no, everything's fine inside the squad. Now he's saying that the Amazon um, documentary is going to affect the, the team, even though he signed it off. And I think there's a, you know, Pochettino has to take a certain amount of responsibility with the fact that one of the reasons, apart from the performances on the pitch that Tottenham looks so directionless is because of the way he's leading at the moment in public. Were, were you convinced? We were both there on, it's going back a few days now, Tuesday, wasn't it? Red Star, yeah. Red Star. Um, were, you, were you convinced um, by the manner of the performance? The oh. results and the, oh, performance yeah, the performance and the attitude? The were you, were you convinced? OK, they're With, back. Uh, I don't know about their back. I mean, I, th I think everyone would take it with a pinch of salt just because of how bad Red Star were on the night. I mean, they, they've clearly had some great results to beat Liverpool, um, and they uh, they beat Liverpool last season. They beat Olympiacos this season. So they're very good at home. They're just um, they're just a different show when they're away, really. So uh, I, I I mean, I thought Tottenham were great, and um, and and all those players we've been talking about, you know, Sun, uh, Delhi, Lamella, they, they 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 played really well. Um, but I don't think anyone was sort of staking staking the season on that performance. I think they've won three league games since the start of the season. I mean, how, how can you? I have a slightly different attitude towards Tottenham. I mean, I think Pochettino, you know, Ian's completely right. He he says week to week, he just says something different. And I mean, if we go back to that game, I remember we were at that game when they, the last game of the season against Leicester, which I think was the summer of the 2017-18 season. Five three, wasn't it? Yeah. Five three, and yeah. that was when he really... Do you remember at Wembley in the yeah. press room? He really just suddenly got stuck in. What's the future? What's going to happen at this club? And then I think 11 days later, he signed a new contract. So the question there, to, immediately I thought, well, that's strange because you seem to be challenging your chairman to sign players and then you've signed a new contract. So maybe, maybe that wasn't... Maybe you were challenging him to give you a new contract. And since then, I feel like his, his message has changed all the time. I mean, he's... He's a very personable, likeable man, but a lot of the time he seems to be complaining. He seems, the balloon seems to go up one week and suddenly we're in crisis, Spurs, and we, we're not going to sign any players and please give me a roadmap for the future. And the next week it's, I don't understand why you lot, are, you, know, you lot are asking me these questions. Everything's fine. So Ian's absolutely right. That consistency of message and, more importantly, the... Um, the relationship with Levy is just, you, you can't figure it out. One moment they're going on a sort of kind of boys' trip to the South America and the next minute they seem to be at odds, whereas Klopp with Fenway, they, they just seem to be hand in glove, really. They, they really, it's one message on recruitment, on staff, and that, that, that contrast is there for everyone to see. Yeah. Um, OK, we'll see how they get on this afternoon at uh, Anfield. Let's just quickly go around the table. I, I think uh, on, on the uh, prediction of a scoreline, because I think... Delhi Ali is now destined uh, to score the winner uh, <laughs> this afternoon. Uh, Ox will put Liverpool in front. Delhi will uh, <laughs> score two in the second half. What, uh, what's going to happen, Charlie? I, I think Tottenham um, actually might get something today. Draw. Two all. Um, I think a, a sort of 
a, a, a reassuring performance from Spurs' point of view, but a Liverpool win. Yeah, it feels like Liverpool need to win after Manchester City's uh, fine result yesterday at home to Aston Villa. OK, we've been talking about superstars this morning. We've talked about Sterling, we've talked about Deli Ali, we've talked about the Ox. Next up, Christian Pulisic. Welcome back with us this morning. Sam Wallace, Charlie Wyatt and Ian Ladyman. Let's just remind you what's in the papers this morning. Front of the Sun's goals pull out. Uh, shooting star uh, Raheem Sterling. 17 goals in 18 games. Sam um, uh, had the privilege of watching him score yet again yesterday for Manchester City in their victory over Aston Villa. Uh, the Sunday Times, Graham Sooners, his column, we've just been talking about this man, uh, Delhi Ali. What's happened to his career? Um, it's looking like a burden of responsibility at the moment. He needs to look in the mirror and ask himself, why have I not progressed? I've just predicted that Delhi will go on to score the winner at Anfield this afternoon. Sam Dean, Dean's piece in the Telegraph. Tottenham continuing to slip. Uh, Liverpool continue, though, to set the pace at the top of the Premier League. They meet each other this afternoon at Anfield. A um, couple of football stories um, uh, in the Sunday People uh, this morning. And uh, Kai Havertz is uh, one of the targets, according to Steve Bates, um, in uh, the People this morning, along with Thomas Muller um, at Bayern Munich. Muller just forced his way back into the Bayern side. He played yesterday in their victory. Unai Emery says that Ozil, Mesut, Ozil acts, Mesut Ozil's axe um, has been authorised by his board. We'll talk about him in a few moments' time. Uh, another deadline uh, in the Sunday Mirror, this time for the Newcastle takeover, and Peter Kenyon wants it done by January, according to the Sunday Mirror this morning. We'll talk about this man now. It's the American Idol um, on the front page of the Stars. Uh, goals put out Christian Pulisic. We've just been having a discussion about uh, the pronunciation of his uh, surname. And I think are we finally all happy on this table, at this table at least, of uh, Pulisic? Well, you're in charge, and you, yeah. you seem to uh, decide that it was Pulisic. Yeah, if you're happy with that. I'll take it. I know it. some people anglicise it and say it's Pulisic. No, I'll take it. A bit it. like Firmino, but it's Firmino. Well, that's just spelling. That's not pronunciation. That's just spelling. It's Firmino. Oh, it's Firmino. oh right. OK. I've heard a lot of Firminos. Though. So have I, but that's, oh, right. just, okay. that's just silly. OK. <laughs> oh, well, let's go with Pulisic for now until, we're, until we stand uh, corrected by Sky Sports uh, pronunciation department. Um, VAR check on that. A VAR check on it, yeah. But he's got a hat-trick yesterday and his Chelsea career finally starting to take hold, particularly in what Frank Lampard said was a typically difficult um, afternoon or difficult evening um, to play at Turf Moor. They knew exactly what would be coming at them and uh, they dealt with everything. They, Chelsea dealt with everything that was asked of them. Seven wins in a row, but also importantly, this guy's three goals yesterday. I think it started for him in... Uh... Amsterdam on Wednesday, actually, I was at, mm -hmm. at that game um, and I think the 20 minutes or so that he had as a substitute when Frank Lampard was, was quite brave in that game because um, a nil-nil draw would have been a perfectly good result for them. Yeah. And with 20 minutes to go, Frank decided to send uh, two attacking players on and try and get, get the win. He was one of them and um, he was influential from the moment he, he came onto the pitch. He set um, a couple of chances up and, of course, the one that he did set up for Batshuayi was the one that won, won the game. And I think... A 20, and, and Frank very cleverly, very sensibly afterwards made sure in his press conference that he, because everybody wanted to talk about Batshuayi and the goal, he made sure that Pulisic got his mention for the assist as well. And I think little things like that can, can really help turn things around for a player. You know, the confidence of players is so, can be so fragile, especially new players who haven't had the best of time since they arrived, foreign players. It can just depend on something like that. And Pulisic has obviously used the the good feeling of, of Amsterdam to, to go and play as well as he did um, in a rather different game at Turf Moor yesterday. Mm. He, did look, he did look good yesterday, Sam. Um, how's uh, Lampard's handling been, been? Because a few weeks ago there were some quotes. This was Joe Prince Wright with NBC say, and, he, and Pulisic pretty much said, I don't really know how I'm fit in here and quite how things are going. I don't really know what's being asked of me. Frank spoke a few days later and I thought the message then was pretty clear. Of, well, just get your head down, work hard and force your way in the team because we've got some damn good players here and if you want to get in, you'll have to be better than them. It's a sim it was pretty much, the message was pretty much mm. as simple as that. Did he respond? Has he responded to that? Yeah, well, it would appear so. It always makes you laugh when this debate of players um, having to drop out and come back in at Chelsea because Frank Lampard always wanted to play and that was a, certainly an issue with, with some managers. Um, and he did say last night, we will have to rotate. He, he, yeah, he, said we, he, we he wasn't so keen on rotation when he was playing and obviously he had the goal scoring record to, to prove it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there were, that, was not, that was not something he liked as a player, but mm. he's, he's the boss now, so um, he, he makes the decisions. I think what he said was interesting that 
um, Pulisic played in the Gold Cup and yes. and the, he didn't feel he was ready. He'd come back early from pre-season. To, sorry, he'd come back early to do pre-season. Um, and I, he didn't, you know, he was... He wasn't playing a lot at Dortmund last year, so he was. Jaden Sancho and him were in contention for that position, uh, and I think, <clears throat> without wishing to lionise the Premier League too much, it is ferocious, and everybody has to go through a period of adjustment. He's still very young. I mean, he, he's, he's. I think he's only 21, mm -hmm. but he's probably. He feels like he's been around. He feels like he's an older player because he's played so much at a young age. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, really, he's the same sort of peer group as a lot of those young Chelsea players that are coming through, like Mount and Abraham, and and Fikio Tomori. So, uh, yeah, it, there's a lot resting on him. Look, Chelsea knew they were going to have that transfer embargo uh, this summer just gone, so they really went for it in January and and signed him. He is their big signing of the summer, mm. um, and and clearly, when you come to Chelsea, you are judged very early. Players, people tend to make. You know, we've seen it. With the lights of Shevchenko, with uh, it can go one Torres. way or another. Torres, sorry, that's another good one. Um, it, 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 if it doesn't start well, the the pattern is it that it, it, it's hard to pick it up. Mm. So I can understand why he was anxious to get going, um, uh, and certainly when he's he's in a team that's quite young, he wants to be playing ahead of these English and um, British boys. But um, yeah, he took his chance, he, and then he, and it was a, it was a good hat trick. I mean, it had a header in there, left foot, right foot. Perfect touch, right? yeah. Charlie, who's the most influential Chelsea player? Who does it all rotate around? Um, I, I would like uh, to say it doesn't rotate around Tomori, but his recovery tackle yesterday, um, mm. I think it was on Rodriguez. Um, it's, I may be correct in a moment, but <clears throat> his recovery tackle yesterday reminded me of Sol Campbell in, the, in his absolute pomp, uh, being able to do that, those powers of recovery. But who is the main man at Chelsea on, the, on that pitch? Well, that's a good point about Tomori. I, I think because everyone speaks about you know, the British players coming in, and particularly people do focus on Mason Mount, don't they? But I think you know, Tomori, to, to, to having come from the Championship, and he's still very young for a centre-back, because that's the most difficult position in the Premier League for any young player. That's why you rarely see 20, 21-year-olds play regularly. For him to do that and have that character, Mm -hmm. a, a part, yeah, and the ability and the awareness and the strength, um, I think you know, in many respects, is you know the Chelsea story of of many good Chelsea stories this season. Um, so that's why, of course, got called up into the you know the England squad, didn't he? Um, so yeah, that that's been uh, yeah really good. And you know, you know Mason Mount, I, I just think there's so many. It, it, it's the the overall Chelsea package, I think, rather than you know one or two, of course. Um, Jorginho is ironic last season the pelters that Sarri was getting for Jorginho playing in that position where Kante used to now this season the same Lampard obviously agrees with Sarri the Chelsea fans have gone a bit quiet haven't they yeah. uh, you, you know, and you know, Kovacic is coming in as well um, Lampard is getting the best out of you know, lots of players uh, not just one or two and equally that's giving him this brilliant position of having a player like Pulisic and not having to play him throughout the first few months to adjust. I'm sure Pulisic, as Sam said, doesn't like it. You know, but I've not come across him by all accounts from some colleagues. You know, he is a bit chippy. And, and obviously, you know, Lampard's been able to put him in his place and said, you've got to work hard, you've got to be patient. These youngsters are in the team for a reason. Yeah. And it's, so it's worked quite well. So, so as, as a result, maybe they're going to get even more out of Pulisic around this time because he's had to be patient, he's got used to his team. Um, so, um, yeah, it's just a terrific story, I, I Chelsea. I thought the same about William as well, because I thought at the start yeah. of the season when David Luiz yeah. left that the, fra that the relationship between William and uh, Lampard was fragile, but now you look at it it's, and it's very obvious that William is a crucial part of the Chelsea team. Uh, one thing I would like to pick up on is Sean Dyche's comments. Um, he said, Callum hudson and we've got to stop Got to, got to stop diving, got to stop cheating in the game. Young player, just come on as a Chelsea substitute. Did he dive? I thought he dived, if I'm honest. I know that you don't. Um, I thought he dived in that way that we sometimes talk about when you <coughs> uh, use that phrase, anticipating contact. And I think that when that I'm happened... I need to ask it for a demo now. <laughs> be the first Sunday supplement <laughs> demo. If I, di if I dive on this one, it would take me a while to get back up. Um, I think he, 
It was one of those where you go into a box, you think, oh, I'm going to get fouled here, I'm, I'm going to take the contact and go. And if you do that, you'll get your, you'll get your penalty and, you, and you'll, you'll get away with it. We were talking off air earlier um, for uh, viewers of our age. I was talking about the Lineker penalties against uh, Cameroon in uh, 1990. He got two of them. And you could argue that he probably died for both of them, but the contact came and he took it, he went down, we got two penalties, we got through a World Cup game. And this <coughs> is a, a similar one where you're waiting for it to come and then it doesn't, and then it, for whatever reason, the Chelsea that, that contact. Up, Chelsea that, are falling up at Burnley. Right. Callum Hudson Odoi comes. I mean, Lineker's Lineker World Cup quarter final. Yeah. Callum yeah. Hudson, <laughs> Callum Hudson Odoi. Chelsea have four 0 up um, at, uh, at at Turf Moor. So, does he need to? Why does he need? To, why I'm not inside to come? his head. I'm not inside <laughs> his head, mate. I don't, so I, I don't know whether he meant to dive or not. Only he knows that. Okay. You asked me, do you think he dived? I think it looked as though he did. Only he knows. It looked as though he did to me, and I think he did so because he was anticipating a contact that didn't come. You think he got nudged in the back, because you mentioned it earlier. You think he got <laughs> nudged in the back. I, I didn't see that. I think he thought contact was coming, and he decided to go with it, and it never came, and he ended up looking a little bit foolish. That, that is my view. I don't know why he did it. Charlie Young? Yeah, I t totally agree with... with, with, with in just because there was contact, and I mean more than ever now, um, and it, it doesn't, you know, it does annoy me. Players, um, and it's been happening for, for a couple of years. Not just the Premier League, but it's worse than the Premier League than the Championship League One, League Two. Is players as they're going down are looking at the referee, <laughs> and you know mm -hmm. they so they know where the referee is, and that I'm thinking so yeah, they're twisting their body looking at the referee. For him to award the penalty, and they've not even hit the deck, and, and that invariably is someone that is obviously looking for the penalty because he's looking for the ref. And there's, and there's a real inconsistency here, and I'll and I, I point this not at us, but more at the kind of ex-player pundits that, that on, on the television. A lot of them will often say, when the contact does come, they'll say, "Oh, he's been really cute there. That's really, really clever play. Really clever play." No, it's not. He's still cheating. He's still cheating. The contact doesn't come. Oh, he's dived. He's a disgrace. I'm sorry. There's no difference between the two. If you go down intentionally. Whether it's under contact or not, you're diving, you're cheating. Mm. So you're right behind Sean Dyche. I think Sean makes. We sat alongside him at his press conference for the next day. Sean, Sean often goes into these um, kind of little rants about it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that they're always best timed. By the way, I'm yeah. not sure they're always best timed. But I, I kind of see his point. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Good stuff, guys. Okay. Next up, uh, oh, we better talk uh, Mesut Ozil. Also talk about Southampton. Their nine-nil defeat at home to Leicester on Friday night. Um, I don't want to be accused of uh, not caring for the guests this morning, but Sam, are you all right? Because you, I know someone tweeted to say, do you need an ambulance? And I, <laughs> I didn't say one thing in that last part, did I? But I, just want, to make, I want to make sure that you're OK. I've, I've got a little bit of man flu, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to battle through it. You're going to battle through it. OK, good. Well, take a few seconds and we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about Ralph, Ralph Hassan Hootle at uh, Southampton in a few moments' time. But uh, after us, of course, after the Sunday supplement is uh, Alex and Camus with goals on Sunday. Let's find out what they're up to, Alex. Good morning. Good morning. Mm, how are you? I'm back with you. You are back with <laughs> your third partner in 24 hours. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not dancing. <laughs> not dancing. We are talking football today. Oh, we what are we indeed. Up? We're talking VAR once again. They gave a penalty for the very first time in the Premier League. <sighs> Oh, VAR. VAR. <laughs> Let the ref go and see the monitor. I think basically that's it. And Sheffield uh -huh. United still unbeaten away from home. We'll yeah. see that as well. All at 11.30. We'll see you then. Looking forward to that with uh, Roberto Martinez um, in uh, a few minutes' time on goals on Sunday. OK, let's uh, talk Mesut Ozil now, Charlie. Um, excluded um, game by game, pretty much, by um, uh, Unai Emery now. Again on Thursday night in the uh, Europa League tie, um, are they trying to break him? Well, it just doesn't fancy him. I think I think that's you know quite quite obvious now. Uh, Unai Emery feels that he doesn't add anything to his team, and we could debate all day whether he's right or wrong. Um, you know, if, if if like any manager, if he felt Ozil was going to add something to his team, he would have him. He would be starting him because obviously, it, ultimately, Unai Emery's wants to protect his job. Um, so if that be getting better results with Ozil in the team, uh, equally, uh, it's all very well to say, well, you know, he earns this and he's not playing. It's, you know, must be great. You know, what's he got to worry about? Um, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for Ozil in that, you know, psychologically, any footballer, this must be doing quite a lot of damage to him.
because you know it must be very very difficult of course he wants to play he did an interview a few weeks ago saying that so that that could have quite lo a long-term impact on Mesut Ozil I fear even when he does eventually leave Arsenal um, who's going to take him is the big issue in terms of his wages and still got a couple of years left so I, I, you know I think we've got to be aware of that as well that uh, obviously you know Ozil has made some you know Big decisions uh, one, in, one in of those his decisions, life. Yeah, one of those decisions, Charlie, was on was on Twitter, social media. So there's the there's a footage of um, Ozil and Unai Emery talking before training, and of course there's the traditional handshake uh, before training as he does with every every one of his players. But then clearly words are exchanged, and then Ozil later tweets a picture of him, um, and it doesn't leave much to the imagination that he is not happy with. No, uh, uh, Unai, Unai Emery and that and and a, and a reflection on that com and a reflection of that conversation. Uh, you know, he, he's a grown up. I think he's got every right to, to put that out there. Do so, you? So, yeah, I do. Yeah. So certainly, you know, you know what? Why? Uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Um, it must be so frustrating, and very, very difficult for him. As I said, you know, he has made decisions you know, off the pitch. Obviously, having the you know, the, the Turkish president as his best man. You know, in, in, in Germany, some of those are, are virtually say very brave decisions. Um, but you know, with football, he's got no future at Arsenal. Yeah, that, that's quite obvious. <laughs> uh, and it'd just be good if someone can pluck up the courage, A, to get him out of the club, but who's going to pay him £350,000 a week? He's not going to suddenly um, you know, just walk away for free, as he will be allowed to. And, and, and then equally, a club who takes Ozil knows they're going to have to be really patient with him. Because even if he does go to another club, it's not a switch. He's not suddenly going to, uh, you know, even though he it, you know, can be a terrific footballer. Um, but he, even before he joined Arsenal, you know, I spoke to a few people in Germany and they were saying what a great player he could be. But even then, it was he'll be good at Arsenal if he works hard enough. Mm. You, know, this, this, it, you know, he's always been that type of sort of, you know, luxury player. Um, and no, I, I just, he's not, is he going to play for Arsenal again if they get lots of injuries, which could happen? Well, we'd see him back, but unless it's, you know the way at the moment, we won't see him for Arsenal. Again. People do, people do love him, and he's clearly talented. We know, we know that. In David Silva leaving, David Silva, similar profile, similar type player, similarly gifted footballer. Um, Silva leaving Manchester City at the end of the season. If Ozil is that good, would Manchester City sign Mesut Ozil as a direct replacement we've not. for David Silva? He's not that good, Ozil, uh, because he won't allow himself to be, because he has none of Silva's work ethic. He has none of Silva's ability and desire to play in pain. You know, Silva's played with, with battered ankles now for the best part of five seasons, tapes him up, gets out there, plays, just right. like Cristiano Ronaldo always has. Ozil's been a failure at Arsenal since the moment he worked through the, walked through the door. Arsene Wenger, the only difference is that Arsene Wenger refused to see it. You can say what you like about Unai Emery's time at Arsenal so far, but the one thing he's got absolutely right is his approach to Mirza Arsenal. He's not good enough, he's not keen enough, he's not brave enough to play in the top Premier League team. And a Pep, Pep Guardiola wouldn't go anywhere near him, I'm absolutely sure of that. Mm. Um, I think you, uh, I, I divide it into two pieces. Um, my colleague Sam Dean went to the, the sort of ancestral town of Erzul in Turkey. And the political pressure he is under as this modern child of Europe who can count three places his home, probably, you know, uh, Gelsenkirchen, where he grew up, Turkey, where his parents moved, where his grandparents moved from, and, and now London, I suppose. And I, I must admit, that piece by Sam really changed my perspective on him because I sort of saw him as, a, as being maybe a little self indulgent. But when you look at, the, at his profile in both Turkey and Germany, I, I, it, that really opened my eyes. Along with the, you know, he was clearly felt that he was racially abused after the after the last World Cup in Germany when he retired from international football. So I think that that is something to be to take under consideration and, and uh, you know put that on the table. The other thing is, I kind of admire Emery for making a stance. I mean, it would be very easy to come in and pick him, but he is trying to do something, and he may fail. You know, he is trying. I mean, 11 senior players left in the summer. I think um, he's, uh, you know, he's tried five different people in the last three mm -hmm. games uh, in that number 10 or that playmaking position. None of them have been Özil. He is trying to develop Willock. He is trying to develop Saka. He has given Gwendozi the platform to play, and I think he's done well. Um, 
He is trying. He is trying to bring through a new generation at Arsenal. He's got a plan. It doesn't always work. It may not work, and it may not work for lots of reasons. He is not a Klopp personality. He's not a Pochettino personality who can, who's who's mm -hmm. got that charisma to dominate the room, and that is important in the Premier League. I, you know, that is so much of what Klopp offers, the 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 big personality and 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 the way he the way he projects himself over a game. He's you know the cameras are all over him in the way that they're not with Emery. Mm. But he is he's trying to do something, and I, I can see clearly watching this week there is there are massive frustrations and and it feels that it's on that it's on that watershed where it could go either way. Um, but leaving a, leaving a player like Ozil out is tough. Yep. But He's made the decision and he'll live and die by it. Yeah, it's a big call, isn't it? Um, we need to talk uh, Southampton as well, Sam, because uh, yesterday uh, you tweeted very early on in the day, didn't you, um, that uh, Hassan Hootel's job at uh, Southampton is safe. Are you surprised, given, given the manner of the um, performance and the way they caved in against Leicester, are you, are you surprised that the board and the owners at Southampton have given Hassan Hootel their, their full backing? Uh, no, I'm not. No, I have to say they, they rate him very highly. I think he's a good manager. Um, certainly, results of that scale can can change the whole can change the world overnight because um, the old the old sort of cliche of the ashen faced manager never was it more true. Watching Ralph Hasenhutl in those post match interviews, he was just sort of it was just one long apology really. And um, I think Nick Harris on the, on the mail said he looks he looks ill. You know, he, he looks really desperate. Um, there's been a lot of change at Southampton over the last uh, 12 months. Les Reed, technical director, has gone. Ralph Kruger, chairman, has gone. And their director of football operations, uh, Ross Wilson, left last month. He's gone to Rangers. So they've got a new chief executive, <coughs> Martin Simmons. He's about to appoint a new director of football, director of football operations, who they think will be in, by, in time for the next international break. Um, but they have been absolutely clear that they really rate Hassan Hootel. They believe in his style of play. They don't think they've got the players to play it yet, but they believe in it. And, and it was made very clear at Staplewood um, by senior board members, um, Martin Simmons included, that, that this is the way forward, that Ralph will be here longer than you. You know, to players, to staff, don't think you can undermine him. We are with him. And I quite admire that, really. The problem Saints have got, they have made mistakes. They were once the kind of the, the, the super traders in the way that Leicester feel are now. Um, uh, they, they've got four players out on loan uh, this, this season. I'm going to try and remember them now. Carrillo, El uh, Wesley Hoot, and there's one more. Um, Lamina. Uh, Lamina. Um, I who, know that because, because you've just read it in my piece. <laughs> um, so that's about 65 million quid's worth. Yes, they've been mistakes. They tried to sign James Madison. They were really close. Some say he was in the building. I, I, I couldn't comment either way, but you know yeah. that, that's that's what some at Southampton were saying. Changed his mind and went to Leicester. The following summer, they wanted to sign Harry Maguire from Hull. He went to Leicester. So I kind of feel like Leicester have sort of replaced them in that, just on you know that really smart traders, who who buy mm -hmm. cheap, sell big. Mm -hmm. um, but they're in the relegation fight. They're in the relegation zone. Of so the, the priority will be survival. Yeah, yeah. But astonishing. Result, astonishing performance by Leicester on uh, on Friday, even again, even though it was against ten men when uh, Bertrand deservedly it, you, got a red card. It, 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 it wasn't a red ash. It, it absolutely wasn't. It wasn't, wasn't a red. red no, yeah. it was a uh, appalling decision. It was a bad decision. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's talk about. Uh, yeah, we, we might get on to we might get on to Bertrand in a minute. But yeah, no, go, great for Leicester. But, but, but by the way, just very quickly going back to Southampton, I, I think that the players really like the manager, but I think there is a fear that. Uh, Hassan Huttle's not going to be there for very long, but obviously the club have got enormous belief in him. But I think they're getting the impression that if there's any job come up in the next few months or next summer, he is gone. And yeah, I think he really is rated. So uh, I w I'd be am amazed either way now uh, whether if Hassan Huttle's still manager of it's Southampton. You lose 9 0 and your reputation gets season. enhanced. Well, well, these days absolutely. Off. This is, this but, is but look, what, what, phenomenal. Yeah, football. exactly. But you know, what, 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 a, you know, what an incredible result. You know, to, you know, away from home as well. And um, pleased for, for Leicester, pleased for Brendan Rodgers, because again, he, you know, I, I think he's a terrific manager. Uh, I think there are supporters of other so-called big clubs that would have sneered at the fact, or were sneering at the possibility, had he have gone to say, for example, Arsenal, chosen him instead of Unai Emery. I think 
personally, Arsenal got the wrong man. I think he'd have been a brilliant fit for Arsenal, Brendan Rodgers. And there's absolutely no doubt that he's going to uh, take Leicester forward. And at some stage, you know, having, having managed two of the biggest clubs in Europe, uh, in Liverpool and Celtic, I'm sure that sooner rather than later, uh, another club's going to come in for him because he, he, he's, um, yeah, he's just a good manager. Mm. Quick word on uh, Bershund. I thought I thought it was I I thought it was a I thought it was a dangerous challenge. It was wild. I, th I thought it deserved. I don't, I don't care what minute of the game is. I thought no, that was wild. Minute, the minute of the game is irrelevant. Um, it was a it was an accident in my opinion, mm -hmm. and it was one of those where if you show me if you put a, if you take a still of it, photograph, put it on the back of the paper, looks like an awful awful challenge. You watch it properly on television, and you you see the you see the, the direction he's moving, what he's trying to do, the force or lack of of his leg going into the, the opposition player and you realise that actually it just wasn't as dangerous as it looked yeah, and, it's, and if, a yellow card would have been enough. If, 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 you, if you watched football on a slow-mo, mm. like a whole 90 minutes... I thought you were going to say if you knew football. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, if, you, if, you watched, if the there'd be, was broken, There'd be 20 something. red cards, wouldn't it? Yeah. If you were just judging a football match on a slow-mo like that, yeah. because it, it's... Just like, yeah. there would be, just like there would be probably 10 instances of players standing on, on each other's toes in the penalty area, like that stupid one that was given against um, Michael Keane at Brighton yeah. yesterday as well. Yeah. OK, uh, hard-hitting stuff from the boys this morning. Let's uh, hear what they've got to say in part five. We'll be talking about Norwich playing Manchester United this afternoon. That's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome back. Uh, we seem to talk just quickly on uh, Brighton Everton yesterday because you just mentioned uh, the Michael Keane penalty that was given um, at the, at the, uh, with the, in the collision with was it a collision with Connolly? I don't I don't know how you describe it. And we've got very different uh, um, opinions on what is a foul these days. Um, I'd probably say that one just just about met, met my threshold. Well, you think it was a foul? Yeah. What I'll say to you is this: if you, if you and I were to stand up in this in this room now, <laughs> and and both stare at the ceiling, and someone was to say to me, while staring at the ceiling, um, and moving around, stand on Ash's foot, I probably wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to do it because I wouldn't know where your foot was in relation to mine. Mm -hmm. Never mind playing in the rain on the on a wet surface, uh, towards the end of a game when players are tired. You telling me that Michael Keane knew what he was doing? You tell you tell me that he knew where Connolly's foot was and he thought, I'll just I'm stand inside, on it. To, to borrow your quote phrase from earlier, I'm not inside his head. Well, I'll tell, I you, well, I, well, I'll tell you, if, <laughs> if, if, if he was doing it on purpose, he got very, very lucky to find his target. It's impossible that he knew what he was doing. It was never a foul. Right. OK, Everton fans uh, will be happy to hear that. They won't be happy about the result yesterday because they lost 3-2 uh, at uh, Brighton. Uh, big game this afternoon at uh, Carrow Road. Charlie, you're on your way there. It's Norwich, of course, against yeah. Manchester United. And it is a big game because Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, after Thursday night's uh, victory in the Europa League, was talking about, well, you need to be on the best... They need to be at their best this afternoon, Norwich. Um, all the checklist, a tough place to play. We know exactly what to expect. Newly promoted side. He, went, he pretty much went through the checklist... Um, Charlie, but um, what sort of game can they expect this afternoon? Uh, well, I, it won't it won't be goalless, uh, that's for sure. I mean, yeah, Norwich drew Bournemouth last week, first time they kept a clean sheet, um, really badly hit. They've got one central defender at the club who's fit, and uh, they've had ten or eleven out some games. Um, so I, I think United, despite Solskjaer's comments, will fancy their chances. Obviously, not won in the league since was mm. it Palace February, which is just terrible, isn't it, for for Away, yeah. for, for a, 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 any sort of top six club wanting to finish in the top six, uh, at least. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, encouraging steps from Liverpool last week. Obviously, totally different game. Um, you know, no point being um, as as defensive, even though they might you know, employ a similar system. So uh, yeah, despite Solskjaer's comments, he will fully expect to win that game today. Mm. Did you have you seen anything different from the last time you were on, which is what four or five weeks ago, Ian, um, when you spoke about Manchester United and their and the current climate at the club and the culture? Have you seen anything change in the last four weeks? No, I haven't um, really. I mean, they, in their defence, they do have some injuries of the, of their own. Um, I don't think they would make an awful lot of difference. I noticed that Solskjaer in his um, in his pre-match quotes made a lot of the fact that Martial is back. Marshall was a decent player. We wouldn't get in any other the top. We wouldn't get in, in any of the other top teams. Um, I just don't think that Manchester United squad has enough about it in terms of ability or mentality to really make an impression 
on the top end of, of the Premier League. And I think they're very, very vulnerable at the moment. They are mm -hmm. very, very vulnerable. They can't score goals. Um, you mentioned the Liverpool game last week. That was much better by Manchester United last week. It was much better. Solskjaer's tactics were, were terrific. He did a real good job um, on, on, on Liverpool to, in terms of negating Liverpool. The fact is they came out of that game having drawn and they've had two shots, they've had two shots on target. And even though they've played well, they've had two shots on target. One of them was the goal, which arguably um, maybe shouldn't have stood. And then they've gone away in Europe on Thursday and they've had one shot on target and it was a penalty. And that is the problem at the moment. And I don't see that improving whoever is in, the, is in the team. And I think that is why Norwich, I don't think Solskjaer will go there expecting to win. I think he'll go there thinking if they come away with a draw, then he'll be OK. Because any team that scores one against Manchester United has got a real good chance because Manchester United don't score goals. Mm. Sam? Well, it's an interesting start in the sun today, just say just how young United's squad is. I mean, I know, I know much has been made about Chelsea, but their average age of their starting eleven is second youngest in the Premier League. Actually, Bournemouth, funnily enough, are the, are the, are the youngest. Um, I think, um, again, you, uh, you look at Solskjaer and you giving a game to Brandon Williams midweek, you can see what he's trying to do. And and he and the principles it feels right, you know, the the young players and the faith in them and even how well Pereira played against Liverpool and, and clearly he's he's kept faith in them. It's just a question of you do I don't want to say luck, because there are some managers for whom that's never really been a consideration. But you do need you do need the breaks to stay in the job long enough for this plan to come forward and you know like Emery I think as we discussed earlier you can see what he's trying to do it's just whether people can tolerate the mediocrity in the interim before they get there I mean uh, that story that we mentioned earlier about Thomas Muller and Kai Havertz mm. and, I mean I, I know they're short of strikers but but what kind of contracts are they thinking of offering Thomas Muller? I, I mean, the last player they signed from Bayern Munich from that great German generation, Bastian Schweinsteiger. I mean, you think they would have learned their lesson there? I, I, that that to me just that's incredible. Um, Kai Havertz, yeah. I mean, one of a tier of very good young strikers in Europe. Yeah. But they have left themselves well short. Yeah, well yeah, short. I thought with Muller, Sam was. I mean, Muller because of his experience. <clears throat> I, I don't know about his motivation. But his experience. Uh, as soon as I saw that, Muller's 30, 30 years old, I just thought back to Laurent Blanc um, being signed by Sir Alex Ferguson. Laurent Blanc. On, a, Laurent, on what, a free transfer? Yeah, but Laurent Blanc. Henrik Larsson. On I, a, was I he was alone? covering United then, and you were, Lado. We, we were both in Manchester. L Laurent Blanc was poor for United. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. there's, this, there's this kind of... Sort I, of I thought he made that. Larsson, much better I was, example. I was he, back Larson, the, much better I was example. back at yeah. the R1 inspired site. Of he came in, he came in for, yeah. He came in for Yapstam. Mm. I mean, Yapstam was still winning European Cups yeah. after he left Manchester United. I mean, Blanc was... Uh, I mean, he got carried in that team because they were such, you know, they were such a dominant side and such a good team. But that was not... I mean, that was not a good signing. Long, and long age, about five years <laughs> and six months at Manchester United, I tell you. Absolutely. Yeah. Looked like an exhausted, worn-down man by the time... His main job finished. was lighting Fabian Barthes' cigarettes, <laughs> I think. I, I, I just... Um, I, I, I take your point. I, I just feel. Did he kiss him on the head before matches then? Well, that, was, well, that was when they were France, winning the World Cup. Right. Yeah, I think, I think that thing, I thing goes down well when you when you're winning the World Cup. Um, uh, you, look, I, I, I haven't watched enough of Thomas Muller um, to, to say whether he would be the, the antidote to United's problems. I just I just feel like if you're looking to sign a striker, aren't you trying to look for the next Sadio Mane, not not Thomas Muller? But who knows? I, the Schweinsteiger episode just suggests to me that, that if Bayern, Bayern are, are pretty canny traders, if they're ready to let him go, then that, that should tell you something. Yeah, I, I yeah. think Madison mm -hmm. could happen next summer yes. at United, which would be a, you know, a, de a decent signing. Um, if, if, uh, plenty of casinos in Manchester. If, top, if, if Leicester in the Champions League and, and Manchester United aren't. Yeah, well, I, still I, think I, that's I, I still think... Yeah. I mean, I, that's not yeah, a joke, yeah, by no, the way. No, no, no. Uh, you know, <laughs> funny, funny if you actually, it, to, when you join Norwich, you actually turn down Liverpool. Mm. Um, but it'd be, it'd be, it'd be a, a move, I think, particularly someone like him would be very difficult to turn down, and, and he would add something. Yeah, they, sure. need, they need um, one or two players like him. Yeah, they definitely do. OK, we're out of time, guys. Uh, thanks very much to, for joining us uh, this morning. Sam Wallace, uh, Charlie Wyatt and uh, Ian Lederman. Sky Sports. Feel it all.